Welcome to today's uh, 10 minutes CME. Uh, so I am Dr. Nishan Sagar. I am an interventional cardiologist practicing at an AR Medicity Hospital, Trivandrum. So uh, the topic for today's presentation is the critical analysis of a STEMI ECG. And the title is you see, but do you observe? Now this is from as you see Sherlock Holmes. So this is a 45 year old who is having chest pain for four hours duration. I want you to see and evaluate this ECG. So, it would be helpful if you take a piece of paper and note down your findings, all the possible information that you can get from this given ECG. And uh, let's see how it improves at the end of this presentation. So again, a 45 year old chest pain of four hours dura duration. Again, the diagnosis is pretty simple. It's a CAD anterior wall MI. I bet mo most of you people will write this as CAD anterior wall MI and will refer it to a cardiology center. So, is there more information that you can get from this ECG? What is this ECG hiding? So, let us evaluate this ECG. So, we shall evaluate this ECG under the following headings. Diagnosis, pathophysiology, site of lesion, prognosis, likely clinical status and management. This is the information we would like to get from this ECG. So, the diagnosis is pretty simple. There is no prices for it. The diagnosis is CAD, ACS, STEMI, anterior wall MI. So, it is a coronary artery disease. It is an acute coronary syndrome. What type of acute coronary syndrome is? It is an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Which wall is involved? It is an anterior wall MI. So, CAD, ACS, STEMI, anterior wall MI. So, that is the diagnosis. What is the pathophysiology? It is acute total occlusion of a single artery by a red thrombus. So, STEMI is occurred due to 100 percent total occlusion of an artery, single artery by a red thrombus. So, wh what is a red thrombus? Red thrombus is a fibrin rich thrombus. So, it responds to fibrinolytics. What is the pathogenesis of n -STEMI? n -STEMI is critical occlusion that means there is still flow. Critical occlusion of one or more coronary arteries by a white thrombus. So, what is a white thrombus? White thrombus is a platelet rich thrombus. So, you give antiplatelets for that. That takes care of the pathophysiology. Now, we come to the site of lesion. Now, since it is an anterior wall MI, only one possible artery can get occluded. It is the left anterior descending or the LAD. So, where in the LAD? So, whenever you get ST elevation in the anterior leads, you look at the inferior leads. If you see ST depression in the inferior leads, it might only be around 0.5 millimeter. It is obviously more here. When you see ST depression in the inferior leads, you localize it to the proximal LAD. So, this is a proximal LAD occlusion. So, site of lesion is proximal LAD. So, whenever you get ST elevation in the anterior leads, you look at the inferior leads. If you get ST depression, it signifies a proximal LAD. Now, there are other markers for proximal LAD like right bundle branch block and ST elevation in V1 by more than 5 millimeters, but this is a topic for another video. If you see ST elevation in the inferior leads, you think of a wrap around LAD. Now, this is what you call a wrap around LAD. This is the LAD coming here reaching the apex which is here, winding around the apex and supplying the inferior wall. So, again you have ST elevation in the anterior as well as the inferior walls. If you see isoelectric or flat ST segment, you think of distal LAD. So, whenever you get ST elevation in the anterior leads, you look at the inferior leads. ST depression, proximal LAD, ST elevation, wraparound LAD, ST isoelectric, it is distal LAD. So, again proximal LAD is involved. So, why is proximal LAD so important? Again, a huge amount of myocardium is at risk. So, myocardial jeopardy is much more. It supplies the conducting system. So, the LAD along with the right coronary artery is the one which supplies the conducting system. There is potential for heart blocks and it supplies the intraventricular septum. So, very important. That is why proximal LAD lesion is very usually results in sicker patients. So, again uh, next we go to uh, the prognosis. So, if you I want you to have a look at V4, V5 and V6. The morphology of the ST segment in V4, V5, V6. There is no descending limb of the QRS complex. You can see that the ST elevation has uh, obliterated the descending limb of the QRS complex. This is a pattern which we call as shark fin pattern. You can see it mimics a shark fin. It is also called the tombstone pattern and some people also call it the action potentialization of the ECG. So, it mimics a cardiac action potential. So, three patterns, shark fin pattern, tombstone pattern or action potentialization of the ECG. So, this actually whenever the descending limb of the uh, QRS is obliterated, it is called a grade 3 injury. So, we shall see that later. 
this is classification as for burn bomb. You can see grade 1 ischemia is just a hyperacute T wave. Grade 2 is ST elevation without QRS distortion. You can see that the QRS is separate. Grade 3 is when it distorts the QRS complex as in our case. Whenever you see a grade 3 ischemia, it automatically indicates involvement of the Purkinje fibers. Now your Purkinje fibers are the most resistant area to ischemia. So involvement of that signifies marked ischemia. The patient obviously is going to be sicker and what is more important is this patient might not have a very good response to primary PCA or thrombolytics. This is the case where you expect higher degree of complications. This is the case where you prepare the family for an adverse outcome. So again, grade 3 ischemia indicates Purkinje fiber involvement, a bad prognosis. So grade 3 ischemia is significantly associated with infarct size, so larger infarct size, impaired myocardial salvage and reperfusion injury, independently associated with MACE, MACE is major adverse cardiac events. So evaluate the CCG, we have established diagnosis, pathophysiology, site of lesion and prognosis, likely clinical status. I want you to see the heart rate, the heart rate is somewhere around 120. So whenever you have an anterior wall MI with tachycardia, especially you have a proximal lady, grade 3 ischemia, it automatically signifies that this person is probably in heart failure or pre-heart failure. This patient is probably going to become sick, sicker. So this is a patient where you auscultate for an S3. So tachycardia and anterior wall MI always think that this patient might be in heart failure or pre-heart failure. So finally management is pretty obvious. Primary PCA is your management of choice which is more than thrombolysis. So we have evaluated the ECG in the following headings. The diagnosis is CAD, ACS, STEMI, anterior wall MI. The pathophysiology is acute total occlusion by a red thrombus. Where is it occluded? Proximal LAD. What is the prognosis? It's bad because of the site of occlusion, the proximal LAD and the type of injury which is a grade 3 ischemia. Likely clinical status, this patient is probably in heart failure or he is in pre-heart failure, he is going to go in for heart failure. What is the management? It is primary PCA. First option, better than thrombolysis. Again, you can see such a lot of information you can get from the ECG. If you're only, if you're only willing to learn more. So that's why I put the title as you see, but you do not observe, but do you observe. Observation is seeing something with, uh, with, uh, with uh, recognition of its significance. This is what, uh, again, ECG is like a murder scene from a Sherlock Holmes uh, movie. So you can actually, if you're willing to learn, you can see a lot of clues from the ECG. So take home points, ECG according to me is the most important single test in medicine. I don't think any investigation gives you as much information about the diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, pathophysiology for such a low cost as compared to your humble ECG. ECG gives you more of uh, information than merely a diagnosis. ECGs are learned over a lifetime, this is very important. Uh, the same ECG can be interpreted at different levels, can be interpreted differently by a house surgeon, by an MD, by a DM or even a person who's done his electrophysiology fellowship. So ECGs are learned over a lifetime. A close examination of ECG is both rewarding for both doctor as well as patient. So put uh, your efforts and time in order to learn ECGs, you will automatically save a life. So uh, thank you and that's for the day. So if you like these uh, presentations, please comment and uh, if you would like more presentations on ECGs, uh, please do let us know. Thank you.